and I want to welcome you to this webinar presentation on demystifying the complexities of free trade agreements, making the case for essential post-pandemic supply chain success, presented by Thomson Reuters. One quick reminder, there will be a question and answer session at the end of this presentation. Audience members are encouraged to submit their questions at any time during the presentation by clicking on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Now, we are all experiencing an increasingly challenging trade environment where unexpected customs duties can hit your supply chain hard. So it's become more important than ever to embrace free trade agreements or FTAs, which can open new markets and lead to significant cost savings. That said, just 23% of businesses interviewed by Thomson Reuters for its annual global trade report said they have taken advantage of all the FTAs that were available to them. Large multinationals that fail to do so are often forced to fall back on manual processes to manage compliance. So today, we're going to hear from a global panel of experts from the USA, Australia, and Asia, who will give us a clear explanation of recent regulatory trends and offer practical steps for positioning yourself for supply chain success. With that, I want to introduce our speakers for today. Elizabeth Connell is Senior Director of Product Management at Thomson Reuters. She is responsible for one source global trade powered by the integration point suite of products. She specializes in helping Fortune 500 companies leverage technology to optimize their global supply chain. Liz is a licensed U.S. customs broker and serves as chair of the Automation Committee and the PGA Working Groups for the National Association of Foreign Trade Zones. Zoe Martinez leads Thomson Reuters' one source global trade proposition across Asia and emerging markets. She helps large organizations adopt technology to meet their global trade compliance requirements, reduce landed costs, and eliminate disruption to the supply chain. In addition to ensuring that customers get the most out of the one source global trade platform, Zoe's goal is to grow the one source business across the Asia Pacific region. And Hoon Sung is Senior Product Manager of Corporate Tax and Trade at Thomson Reuters. Hoon is responsible for managing the FDA module of global trade management. Prior to joining Thomson Reuters, he served in various roles at consulting firms, including KPMG Korea and PwC United States. Hoon also has hands-on IT experience as a system engineer from one of the largest mutual companies in the USA. So with that, I want to turn it over to Zoe, who is going to give us a just a summary, kind of set the scene for us of the situation with regard to FDAs as a basis for our discussion today. So Zoe, take it away. Thanks very much, Bob. Very happy to be here um, and speaking with everybody today. Look, I think post-pandemic um, supply chain is almost a, a little bit of a myth. I mean, I think it's a it's a new world. It's a, a, a new type of supply chain. And uh, just, just from a contextual perspective, I think it's really important to note that um, we are operating in an area of um, the, the highest rate of uncertainty that we've seen in this space um, ever, as, as far as I'm aware. So 2019, um, I was sitting sitting at a conference and, and listening to trade compliance professionals talk about how busy they were managing the uh, managing the trade war. And if you have a look on the screen at the moment, you can see across the world now more and more things are coming through. So, um, talking about free trade agreements today is is a really big thing for me. Um, I, we oft, often talk about it in the context of how we can make an opportunity out of uncertainty. So it's good to know that whilst we have these activities going on, there are, there are other mechanisms at play that can help us be more successful and, and, and get more out of our supply chain in spite, of, in spite of the challenges. One of the other things about free trade agreements as well that I think is um, really, really important right now um, is that they are getting bigger. They're bigger, they're bolder. Uh, we're looking um, far and wide in terms of, in terms of scope. Um, also in terms of the types of inclusions. But if we have a look at a few, uh, few of my favorites, uh, hopefully everybody on the call today is, is quite familiar with them. Um, but if we look at RCEP that's been recently signed in my part of the world, the Regional um, Economic Partnership Agreement, um, this is actually by far and away the biggest, the biggest in terms of scope. Um, it allows people that are moving into this part of the world to, to really take advantage of strong relationships between the countries um, to accelerate um, accelerate their financial position. 
CPTPP. US sadly is no longer a part of this. Again, a, another really massive, massive agreement. Um, we are seeing continued interest in that. And the USMCA, which is probably the, the most well-known or the replacement um, of, of your, your most well-known agreement um, in, in more recent times. So um, really, really big. So the benefits when you get into these big agreements is, is huge, provided you know how to take advantage of them and, and gain access. So to, the, to that point and why we're all here today, so you know, why is it so complex? Why are we talking about demystifying free trade agreements? Um, you would think that anybody that has an opportunity to save money would just go, great, I'm going to do that. So we need to understand what some of those barriers could be. And we'll talk about these as we go through, go through the session today. But certainly we have complexity from the supply chain as, as we're seeing, you know, the different, different factors that are really impacting us. Um, it's really important to note that all free trade agreements themselves are actually different. So it's not just as easy to say, I'll use this one and that one. We really need to understand what's going on. We need to make sure we meet their rules. Um, all of them have their own docu documentary requirements, the burden of proof. What are we doing? How do I collect my data? Um, so all of these things come in and, and act as somewhat of a barrier to people, you know, maybe even having the confidence to, to get started. So um, hopefully throughout the course of the session today, everybody will feel a bit more comfortable, a bit more excited, um, because really at, when it gets down to it, and, and this, is, this is really important to me at my core, it's something I talk about a lot um, with, with all of the customers and clients that I've worked with um, all, all the way around the world, actually. Building, this, build, building these tools and free trade agreements are a tool really for trade compliance professionals um, into your overall supply chain strategy um, is something that you really need to do. So it's duty optimization. It's about saving money for the business. Um, and once you have that entrenched within your supply chain and you have compliance and you have supply chain working well together, it's really an, an enabler for the business. So it's no longer a detractor, but it really helps you accelerate your position. Um, through through many, many levels. So we'll go through that as well from, you know, starting points from sourcing all the way to how do I end up getting my, you know, competitive edge on, on my, um, in my deals? How do I get to my optimised landed cost? So those are the kinds of things that are always our goals. So really happy to be here with everybody uh, talking, talking about these today. Well, thank you very much for that uh, opening, Zoe. At this point, before we launch into the panel discussion portion of our presentation, I want to pose the first of several audience questions. I'm going to ask you and the audience to choose from among, number, from among a number of choices based on this question. And question number one, how important are FDAs to your business? Please take a look at these following options and click on one of them. Critical, important, moderately important, not an issue. So please take a few seconds, audience, to click on those while we wait to see what you're going to say. I'm particularly interested in hearing this and especially interested in hearing Zoe talk about how the bigger and bolder environment of FTAs at a time when all we ever hear really in the headlines is about conflict, tariffs, trade wars. And here we are now talking about the positive side of, of trade cooperation. So let's see what the uh, audience has to say. Well, okay, very interesting. How important are FDAs to your business? Critical, 27%. Important, 40%. Moderately important, 20%. Not an issue, 13%. Well, I think that bodes well for our discussion today. I think for the most part, companies really are uh, taking a close look at FDAs, and it's all the more reason why it's important that we now talk about that and help you to understand how you can participate. So with this, I want to launch into our panel discussion. I've brought in Liz and I've brought in Hoon and here's Zoe, who you saw before. So we're all here to answer the following questions as well as audience questions at the end. Don't forget about that. Here's the first question. I'm going to ask Liz to lead us off with this one. You know, it seems that every other day we're hearing news that a new FTA is being signed. What are the most exciting developments for businesses headed across 2022? Liz, what are you seeing, for instance, in the U.S. market and for USMCA, United States, Mexico, Canada agreement? Yeah, that's a great question, Bob. So I guess I'd say there's two things um, around MC USMCA specifically. So it's still, I would say, the main story for U.S. companies, and it's for a couple of reasons. First, um, as you probably know, Biden ordered a review of American supply chains with the specific goal of reducing dependencies on China to produce some of the critical inputs. 
So U.S. companies now more than ever should be looking to create an integrated supply chain, a regional one. And so USMCA is perfect for that for U.S. companies. So it, it gives you a viable alternative um, to save a lot of money. And we see it especially in the automotive industry here in the U.S. I'd also say USMCA is top of mind for U.S. companies right now. Um, because the initial sort of enforcement of USMCA by customs was, I'll say, flexible. They were pretty loose. And so we're now starting to see some new enforcement. But what I would say is interesting is that USMCA contains what's considered sort of the new approach to labor laws, where it's much stricter than other FTAs, which is supporting that S in the ESG kind of goals that many corporations have. And that's actually what US Customs is enforcing more, um, which is a new approach on enforcement of free trade agreements here in the US. But I would say if we look past USMCA, I know that many are hoping that the UK and the US sign a free trade agreement sooner rather than later, but this is probably um, gonna take some time. Uh, Biden's USTR office said, they may try more modern approaches to trade between countries, which I think we're seeing in the reduction of tariffs on British steel. So leveraging things other than FTA. So the US is kind of, I would say, slow in the FTA world. Now, if you're a US company or an EU company, just because Zoe mentioned that we're not part of CPTPP or RCEP or any of these other agreements, you should be evaluating those free trade agreements. It's critical that you're, you're kind of looking at your whole supply chain because you're probably moving parts and components and inputs regularly through these APAC countries. And so you can take advantage of them, even though the US isn't part of these programs. So maybe with that, I'll send it over to Hoon. So you could give us some insight into the APAC region and what you guys are seeing over, what you're seeing over there. Yes. Uh... As, as Zoe mentioned, uh, the FT is getting bigger and bigger and bolder. So uh, in here, actually, with the RCEP going effective as of this year, the beginning of this year, uh, pretty much is on the news every day. So uh, while we've been seeing in the past, like, for example, the 2009, the economic crisis in this region, uh, a lot of countries like, for example, South Korea has been recovering from that crisis with uh, those increased the export volume with those countries uh, with the FTAs uh, get, uh, get signed off. So uh, we are expecting, uh, especially with this uh, mega FTA like RCEP, where uh, this is the first FTA covering full, uh, among China, Korea, Japan, all together, this is uh, actually uh, kind of brand new, uh, the new FTA uh, we are dealing together in, 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 this, in this region. And also uh, the RCEP includes the, the, the South, Southeast Asian uh, countries, which we consider as a manufacturing hub in the APEC region. So combining this all together, companies are actually looking to uh, to kind of maximize the, these opportunities going forward. So we, are, we can actually build a global value chain within the region. And it covers like 30% of the population globally and also 30% of GDP. So I think this is the biggest FT in here. So a lot of companies are trying to see like how they're gonna kind of utilize or like leverage this FTs being available in this year. So. Yeah, it's really exciting in, in APEC region in terms of this FT uh, adoption uh, going forward. Right. Thank you very much, Hoon. What can a company expect to get out of using free trade agreements? What are the benefits? How can they support businesses as we navigate through the pandemic? Zoe, why don't you take the lead on that one? Thank you. Look, I think, I think it's a really good question. Why, why would I go down this pathway? Um, and one of the things that 
uh, I think we learned in the past few years is that we couldn't always rely on our traditional sources of supply. Um, I mentioned we had these factors, disruption. If we have a look at the semiconductor space at the moment, even still, we, we're still having challenges. I bought my daughter a laptop and now I can't buy a car. So we're, we're living in this environment where things are being diverted and they're going into different areas. Um, I think that what that really um, drove home to a lot of organisations was that they needed to have a plan B, a plan C, a plan D. Um, and they're also looking to move a lot of their manufacturing sources of supply closer to home. Um, semiconductors, again, you'll see the plants being set up and established in the United States, this whole concept of near sourcing. So all of a sudden, I, my traditional model is gone. Maybe what I was doing in free trade agreements before no longer applies. Maybe I'm not operating in those countries. Maybe I have these new opportunities. So what we found that companies that were able to you know, make these agile decisions and, and move into these new economies or make these choices, um, they were able to evaluate, well, what does my FTA landscape look like when I get in there? How can I then accelerate some of those business benefits, savings, or what is my cost impact going to be if I don't have those free trade agreements available, the ones I traditionally look for, towards? So it presented a really... Um, unique opportunity for businesses to really reevaluate how they were structuring themselves and include free trade agreements in their decision making process. Um, I look a lot. I look a lot at Asia. This is where I am, but it, it's a model we see again and again: Latin America, Mexico, um, specifically out here in Southeast Asia. That Hoon was mentioning, um, we saw an incredible amount of migration, not just from COVID. I mean, from from the trade war before that, a lot of manufacturing was being moved China plus one out into Vietnam, out into Thailand, and when you're presented with this new opportunity like RCEP, all of a sudden it didn't really matter which economy I went into because I had this option that gave me sort of this plate to where, where could I choose? So, you know, I have ambitious countries, North Asians that are signing these big agreements. Everybody else is on the journey. Um, how, can, how can businesses take advantage? So I think, I think that's the really important thing to shine a light on that um, they're there as this tool and as this asset to business. Um, and as you're making these choices and moving around, um, they can really help you, you know, get some landed cost savings. Liz, can you speak to some benefits that you see deriving from FTAs for companies? Yeah, I mean, I think I think Zoe covered it really well yeah. in that companies are really looking for ways to protect their bottom line. Yeah. The, the last five years have been pretty volatile in trade and FTA is duty to free. Apparently, my dog has an opinion as well about this. I, I, I call, I, that sounds like an agreement bark to me. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to hand it to Hoon for a minute while I uh, deal with okay. this. Okay. <laughs> Hoon, what do you think? So, well, yeah, definitely FT is a, is a vehicle to, to maximize or pretty much using the FT, the company, companies are becoming more competitive because you have a lower duty rate on your customer side. So mm -hmm. uh, you, can, you can export more into that country with a better pricing structure. So definitely is an opportunity to leverage. And uh, of course, a lot of companies already uh, taking a look at it or they're already using it, but still the adoption rate of the FK for like global multinational companies are not that high. So. I think they have to kind of maximize these opportunities by looking into these new FTAs available or existing uh, big FTAs. If not, they're still not using it. I think they should start taking it. Well, I hope they're hearing the message of all of you are. Uh... Zoe, are you raising your hand for more? Of this? I, I do. I just, wanted to, I just wanted to make a comment quickly too, um, just in the interest of stealing some, some of Liz's thunder. One of the things we saw that was so incredibly interesting about um, free trade agreements signed more recently was it was really at the C-suite level that people had the interest. We had this, we had right. a 12-month ramp up for RCEP and CEOs were calling, everybody is calling, how can we take advantage? What does this mean? And this was even before it became ratified. So um, there was a there was a lot of thought processes around um, bringing these kinds of things at that high level within the business. So as a, a trade compliance professional, it was a really unique time as well because we had the stronger voice um, and people really saw, you know, this is this is a vehicle. So I just want I just wanted to point that out too that um, traditionally maybe FTA was sitting sitting down maybe a little bit in the weeds, people that knew how to work them and they spent their time trying to get things done. But but now people are really thinking about it top down, and I think that's that's been a the, the most significant change I've seen, at least from a, a company approach to FTAs through this more recent challenging time. 
Great. Th thanks so much for those observations from all of you. I'm going to put up now a second poll question for our audience to uh, answer. And uh, the question will be as follows. Post-pandemic, which region are you most focused on for new FTAs? Choose just one of the following, North America, Latin America, Asia Pacific, Europe, or you can choose all of the above. So uh, take a few seconds there, audience, and uh, click on one of those. Obviously, every single one of those is essential these days. I mean, as we're pointing out, we're learning today, these uh, FTAs cover just every part of the world, all the major trading partners. And uh, the idea that this also gives um, traders more flexibility at a time when they're trying to diversify sourcing and lower their risk of single sourcing, it seems like FDAs really come into play as an important factor here. So I think we're gonna bring up our audience response here. Which region are you most focused on for new FTAs? 25% say North America, 0% say Latin America, interesting. 36% say Asia Pacific, 7% say Europe, which who knows what's going on in Europe, and 32% all of the above. That one's interesting too, because if people are, um, our companies are progressing on all fronts. So thank you audience for your input on that one. Let's move on with the panel now with another question. And this is the following. We have heard that FDAs are complex. For those that are new to FDAs, what are the complexities they need to be aware of? Hoon, what do you think? Well, yeah, this is one of the main reasons why some companies are not even trying to adopt this FTA concept because, uh, well, we are dealing with uh, many FTAs out there. So even with one trade lane, potentially there are multiple FTAs available. So that's kind of daunting. So. Uh, I think, well, the companies, they what, especially when they are uh, kind of first newcomer for this FT, uh, FT world, I, I think we, we should, I mean, the companies should start with the basic stuff. So uh, identifying, you know, what are those, uh, the product flow that you guys have. So where your product is manufactured, where these are uh, going to export it to, into. So you, you kind of draw your lines about uh, the product flow. And also another important piece about it is also uh, you, you need to uh, kind of make a flow. I mean, uh, analyzing the flow for the document. So uh, a lot of MSC multinational companies, we, we have these third party invoicing situations. So not just only for the product flow, you have to understand about, you know, your document flow as well. So that is kind of a basic kind of, that, that gives the companies the basic view of your kind of trade lane that is available. Then you can identify what FTA is available. And also uh, the other aspect, I mean, a lot of companies I saw that spend a lot of time is, uh, you have to have, have a, a very good classification of your products so that because each FTA uh, depends on what product you are dealing with, there, there could be a different rules of origin. So having a very good understanding of your products, what type of rules of origin out there is uh, I think the basic stuff that you have to kind of take a look at. And also when, when you're talking about products, of course you, you are sourcing as Zoe and Lisa mentioned that maybe you are sourcing this from your near countries domestically or you know some way different uh, side of the world so uh, understanding your supply chain where you are getting your parts from is another kind of basic stuff the company should uh, kind of focusing on at the initial stage then there are uh, a lot of many stuff that we're going to cover as a, as a panel discussions later on but i think these are the the basic stuff that the company start looking at when they are considering uh, to, to utilize the FTAs out there. Certainly no less complex being outside an FDA to be involved in international trades. And a lot of the things you just said, Hoon, are subject to any type of trading with other countries and following another mm -hmm. country's rules. The advantage, of course, of being in an FTA is that you get benefits along with the complexities. Okay, so we've heard earlier that FTAs are all unique. 
in practical terms, what does that mean? What should companies be looking for? Zoe? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Bob. Look, I think the the, the thing to note about it, free trade agreements and, and probably um, the, the group of people that like them just as much as I do are the lawyers um, that spend, you know, eight, 10 years negotiating them, um, is that they are legal instruments. Um, these are negotiated over a long period of time. And um, if you've ever received a hard copy version of, of a free trade agreement text, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a light document. It's, it's a tome and, and you might need to get a suitcase to carry it around. So um, when people go in and they have a look at them, the, the reality is that they're actually consuming really legal legal te text. It's, it's quite, you know, there's a lot of legal jargon in there and they can be really, um, really challenging to understand. Um, and as each, each of these negotiations take place between different countries, is all of them have their own different vested interest. Um, they all want to share and care and let, let's all grow together, um, except for this or except for that and look out for this little, this little space. So it's really important to, to take a step back and say, okay, um, I might have these FTA options, but no, not all FTA is made equal. So it could be that the benefits are different. It could be that the rules are different. Um, it could, could be that there are certain exceptions. So each one has to be evaluated on its merits. Um, and, you know, where, where you can, you know, go, go for um, the government instruction that sits on top, on top of the legal text that they try and break it down to make it more easy for people to consume. So having a look at some of those areas. But, um, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's really the, the key, key point to take away is that they, they're unique because of the way that they are negotiated and they do have different objectives and different inclusions. So taking each, each in its own merits is, is, the, is the right way to go. So no single template that you can just fill in the forms and you're participating in FDAs all over well, the place. Huh? Well, well boss. okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, well, I'm just, I'm going to jump in here. I, I'm sorry. Please here do. I no, 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 no. Don't on, apologize. But... I want to hear, you know, please tell me. So here's the thing about these bigger and bolder free trade agreements. All of a sudden they've got a bigger scope and they give you the potential to perhaps put away and put on the shelf these five other ones that you've used in the past and maybe you can just concentrate and use one. So um, free trade agreements are ever evolving. They're signed all of the time. And the agreement that was signed 35 years ago um, may not be the right one for you anymore. Um, so look for the ones that give you the best benefits most, most of the time and, and then manage the difference. So RCEP, CPTPP um, are really good examples for us. And if we talk about the UK coming out of, you know, post-Brexit, they have been very active in negotiating new ones too. So they're even joining outreach into, into other areas. So um, you, you'll find that um, they're all carving their own pathway. And some of these renegotiations, the, the newer FTAs are actually by design supposed to simplify some of those challenges for business oh, in theory. In yeah. Theory. For, for example, the single rules of origin for many countries within that mega FTS. I, I think there is kind of the unique characteristics of the modern mega FTS to make it simpler. Great, okay. Well, I think it's time for our third and final poll question for our audience. And this one is going to ask the question of you, what are the major challenges that you envisage running into? Please check one of the following. USMCA, that is United States, Mexico, Canada Agreement Rules of Origin, receiving supplier certificates of origin, deciding which is the right FDA to use, or insufficient resources to manage FTAs. So clearly, uh, for all of the benefits we're talking about, there are some potential obstacles or challenges to companies that... Uh, either aren't prepared or haven't delved into the details of FDA. So I, we're very curious to hear which of these four our audience members is most concerned with. So just a few more seconds and we will bring up the results of that final poll question. Okay, interesting. USMCA rules of origin, just 7% of our audience thinks that that will be the major challenge that they're running into. However, 50% say receiving supplier certificates of origin, which I guess you know, is a general thing applying to any FTA. 21% are worried about deciding which is the right FDA to use. Guidance to that is coming you know, from our speakers today. And finally, 46% say insufficient resources to manage FTAs. That's very interesting as to where, you know, whether the C-suite is, is, is allocating enough, uh, enough for companies to do that. So thank you audience for those, um, th those insights into what you're concerned with these days. 
Okay, then another question is all of this that we're hearing, is this consistent with what you're hearing from customers? And the, you know, the, those who are actually in the trenches dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis, let me start with Hoon on this one. Yeah, well, I would go with all of above in the poll mm. if I'm a customer, <laughs> because okay. well, it's, it's, I, I think it relates to each other. So uh, usually uh, when companies are starting uh, like FTA projects, they kind of underestimate the effort that it, it, need, it requires to make it operationally successful. So uh, I would say that, you know, managing these suppliers, getting this uh, certificate of origin from them uh, or the origin evidence from the suppliers, I think that is the most challenging one because some of the suppliers are having the same issue. They are understaffed. They don't know about FT rules in detail. So because all these uh, vertical suppliers, they need to also run this uh, the origin analysis, origin determination for their goods. So this is all related. So uh, for companies to make sure that they are getting the right evidence from the suppliers, they need to identify which suppliers they're dealing with. And it is not only for domestic suppliers, we are talking about you know, the international global suppliers as well. You need to give them some training to make sure that they are calculating this correctly. And then just just matter of requesting them the solicitation, sending the solicitation and receiving the result from them. Uh, and then uh, incorporating those origin information that you receive from suppliers and put into the our own uh, origin determination of my product. That is not a kind of part-time job. So. Well, from my experience, I think this is the most painful uh, kind of area where company, uh, our customers are spending a lot of time to make sure that they are doing this. And this is not just one time thing. They have to do this uh, on an annual basis at the minimum. And any, any time when the supply chain got changed, I mean, the supplier uh, sourcing structure is changed, you have to do this again and again. So as you can hear, <laughs> This is not a simple job and uh, well, I think it, it requires uh, dedicated resources for the customers, I mean, the companies. Thanks, Maybe sir. Liz, you, you, you've seen other <laughs> difficulties. Well, Liz, what do you think? What are you hearing from yeah. customers on your end? Yeah, I, I mean, from my perspective, it, customers want to save the money and they're, it's not going to be easy, right? You've got to jump through the hoops to get the savings. And so to have those resources dedicated to doing it right, because they're complex, mm -hmm. right? But they're also come with some risk. So having somebody who's knowledgeable, having automation to, to make that experience easier so that you're optimizing the savings and ensuring compliance, that's, I mean, it's a commitment, but it pays off big time if you do it right. So I, I think it's like any other duty deferral program or savings program. The money is not just going to grow on trees. You're going to have to work for it. And so having the right team and tools in place to do it. So I, I uh, am not surprised at all by the pools. It makes a lot of sense with what we're hearing. Yeah. At, at a time when over the years, I mean, so many companies fail to take advantage of even straight, supposedly straightforward programs like duty drawback. You know, mm -hmm. not not realizing the full agreements, and then here we are with something far more complex. And uh, so clearly, the expertise is is so important there. Thanks, uh, Hoon and Liz, for, for that. Okay, here's the here's a big question. It's about implementation, the real world practical aspect of this. How do you go about it, Zoe? Where, where to start? I, I, you know, that that's probably the 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 major point of the question, and that's really understanding well. Uh, what's my supply chain look like? Um, it's a really good, particularly if you're starting this for the, for the first time, um, coming in fresh, it's actually a really good way to map out your supply chain, understand your sources, connectivity, your, your country pairings. Um, and so once you have all of that information available and you know um, what you're buying from where, what it is, you can really then assess, well, what are the different free trade agreements I actually even have to, to choose from? So um, building out that kind of um, theoretical mapping of a potential opportunity really, really is helpful. And then it comes down to, well, okay, what's going to give me the best bang for my buck? So how can I, how can I prioritize? What am I, what am I looking at? 
um, so that you can say, okay, you know, maybe, and maybe it's regional, you know, we often see this at regional in one area, that these are the three FTAs that will deliver me the best, best outcome. And it might be in America, it's USMCA, we don't worry about too many others, you know, so getting those priorities, um, and then really going through an activation process. So starting to go through and really saying, okay, so I, I have my potential opportunity, I understand that I'm trading between these, these countries, and these are my sources. Um, can I really make, can I really convert this into, into true savings? So doing the qualification, having a look at, you know, what my bill of material is, um, do I satisfy the rules of origin? Do I have enough origin content? Um, you know, understanding where I am and then really pushing that forward as part of an ongoing strategy. So um, that strategy might include automation. Um, it can certainly really help to, to keep, the, keep the engine moving if, you know, in the absence of a lot of resource. Um, but otherwise, it could be as simple as, you know, including that as part of your sourcing, you, you know, your sourcing exercise. So talk about um, missing the supplier certificates. You know, I see often right now a lot of people in the procurement or sourcing part, part of the business, um, they'll include this as a requisite. They'll, they'll say, you know, on the basis of the price you've given me, I'm going to need this certificate. Otherwise, the price price you gave is it's not the real one and I'll go with somebody else. So, you know, we have a particular client out here um, that um, was working between Japan and Europe. And this is this is the pinch. They they kind of said, okay, Europe and Japan signed this new free trade agreement. I can either buy from you with a, with a certificate or I'm going to buy from my friends in Taiwan because, you know, I, I like them and there's no free trade agreement. So, you know, I'm just going to go with my, my preference at this point. So um, it really becomes a competitive advantage um, getting, getting to that spot. So even st starting at the sourcing, educating suppliers that this is part of your process, it's mandatory um, and setting that tone, you know, that's before you even bring the goods in and start your manufacturing process. So building that in um, and keeping that rhythm um, entrenched within the day-to-day -day business operations is, is definitely the way to go. Thank you, Zoe. Hoon, what would you have to say about implementation? Yeah, well, I think the another aspect of the implementation, I, I would say that uh, the companies also understand your product very well. So the skeleton of all these FTs about your bills of materials. So uh, getting the right bills of materials to, to, to prepare all these data, supply, understanding the supply chain, or, or et cetera, is actually uh, coming from these bills of material first. So uh, some companies, they manage this very well in ERP. Some companies, they're using in-house system to managing this or some even, I, I'm seeing some companies even using like kind of Excel <laughs> to manage all this. So gathering all these kind of different data from different departments to prepare this FK is another, I think, a challenge that companies are facing. And maybe just add one more thing. FTAs sure. aren't an all or nothing game. And so mm -hmm. if you're going to start implementing, sometimes it's easier to just start small. Pick yeah. a product mm -hmm. that gives you the yeah. most savings and build on that. Because um, I think that's another sort of complexity or fear that many companies have is that I'm going to get into free trade agreements. And they're like, oh, that's so big. Just start small. You're right. Yep. Get the experience and you can keep building on it, adding to it um, over time. So great. Yeah. Good yeah. advice. Mm -hmm. OK, so how do global trade management solutions, I take it we're talking here about aspects of technology and applications, support businesses wanting to optimize their supply chain and optimize their costs? Liz, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great question, and I think it makes the whole experience a lot easier. So I got into global trade over 20 years ago, and I, many of you on the phone can probably relate that the compliance department was not, we'll say, the cool kids in town, right? We, <laughs> we were the enforcers. We were causing all the problems. We wanted to do everything by the books. Over the last five years, I would say um, compliance departments have become the coolest people in an organization. The CFOs love us. The supply chain people love us. We are where companies are going to figure out how to find their savings, whether it's to retaliatory tariffs, the pandemic issues with um, trading between countries, vessels getting stopped, whatever it is, you know, forced labor is coming. All of these things are impacting companies' bottom line, and the global trade solutions give you give companies a unique perspective on their supply chain. So we heard Zoe and Hoon say, it's important to know where you're mapping your supply chain. 
Well, in a global trade solution, you have that full visibility of your supply chain, which gives you areas of opportunity to do some of that analysis that Hoon and Zoe, or yeah, Hoon and Zoe mentioned in an automated way, right? And also looking for areas of opportunity um, to move your supply chain to take advantage of these other free trade agreements. And maybe free trade agreements aren't the answer for your savings. There's duty deferral programs, like you mentioned, Bob, drawback or foreign trade zones or Mekila doors, like you pick it, a global trade solution can help you kind of identify areas of opportunity for those savings. So it's not just about compliance enforcement, it's more around savings and visibility um, for areas of opportunity. So I, I think it's a, a really unique perspective and can save companies a, a ton of money. Great, thank you for that. Um, Hoon, what do you believe is needed to successfully automate free trade agreement management? Well, I think, uh, again, so in order to run your FTA program in compliance with all these regulations out there, I think a lot of people feel not comfortable about it. So I think the, the essence, the, the fundamental thing is the, you know, where, where you are getting the data and how you're going to integrate that with the, the software that you're going to use. So, uh, well, I would say that, you know, identifying or building a really nice understanding of those different stakeholders within a company. So you are, you are, you are not just dealing with one data source. So we are talking about bills over materials. We are talking about sales data. We are talking about purchasing record material value, all these kind of stuff is pretty much the data within your company. So it could be a single source in your company, or it could be like suppliers, even suppliers, we need to get this information. So how you uh, kind of make the strategy, you know, integrating all this data into one software, I, I think that's the, the most critical piece of the success of the implementation of the FTA software. And the other piece that I, I emphasize again is that even if you have this art of, the, I mean, this rock solid uh, software in-house, if you are not getting this uh, evidence or certificate from suppliers, you are not gonna pass these uh, rules of origin out there. So you pr probably not taking uh, the advantage of in investing in the automation. So I think, well, in parallel, when, when companies are preparing this you know, data source, all that important, but I think the companies also start this uh, supplier management kind of program in advance so that at the time of the go live of the system, you should have all this data ready so that in a day one, you can actually enjoy this benefit uh, right away. Otherwise, you have to spend another year to get this evidence from suppliers. As, so. That I think is another piece that, you know, successful implementation that, you know, what companies should kind of take a look in very detail in advance before getting into this implementation project. Great, so that, thank that you is very, my take. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and thank you, all three of you, for an excellent panel discussion. I'd like to turn now to our audience question and answer portion of our presentation. And even as we are answering the questions that have already come in, audience, you are encouraged to continue to submit those questions by clicking on that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to as many of those questions as we possibly can, time permitting. Okay, this first question is referring to GSP, Generalized System of Preferences, which is the largest and oldest U.S. trade preference program. It goes back to almost 50 years. This questioner is asking, Will companies encounter issues receiving the savings as it was stated this program will be re retroactive once signed? But the reactivation of this particular program has taken longer than it has in the past. As you mentioned, FDAs are forever changing. Does this open issues for importers currently claiming for a program that is currently deactivated? I'm just going to throw that out to whoever wants to, whoever might talk about that. I mean, um, maybe Liz, are you, uh, are you, you have an observation yeah. there? I think it's a great question, and we're seeing this more and more here in the U.S., where um, whether it's 232, 301, free trade agreements are retroactive, and it makes it even more complex for importers to comply. And so I would say 
you know, it's another benefit of a global trade solution and having some automation because those start and end effective dates would be taken into account. I can also say that some of the countries when you're doing the filing will also do audits to ensure um, it's a valid agreement at the time of filing. So it, it's hard to keep up with. Um, I'd even say USMCA is a great example. Not only is it retroactive or uh, it's, it's changing every year. So like the regional value content is changing every July as we step through the next couple of years. So staying on top of it's really challenging. But I, I think if you have tools and automation in place, it can ensure compliance. Well, this question actually is a follow-up to your discussion of automation, asking can FDA qualification process be automated? Who would like to uh, jump on that? Yeah, let, maybe let me take that one. Um, so a, absolutely. Um, the, the benefit of, of these kind of tools is, is that that's effectively what it does. Uh, Hoon was mentioning about the integration of the data. Um, and I, I can tell you 15, 20 years ago when I was the one on the spreadsheet calling everybody for the data, that was what my, my work was. I was really collecting everything very manually, losing all of this time, like great packet loss. Um, and then, you know, it's, got, it's going through that process of automating sort of mathematically in, in your head. Um, the benefit of the software is it really takes in that data from those sources. So you get that, that trusted data coming in. Um, and with the codification of the rules as, as a, you know, a mathematical equation in the code, um, it's going through those, giving you, the, giving you those outcomes. Um, and you're not doing it just for, let's say, one bill of material or product at a time for a, for a free trade agreement. What you're actually doing is, you know, doing all of the bill of materials that you have against all of the free trade agreements that you want all at the same time. Um, you can come in in the morning, it's run all, all overnight. You can actually see your results. I have 75% that have passed, 25 that haven't or warrant further attention. So um, it really does liberate. So it's automation, and, and I think this is true in a lot of spaces. It's not, it's not just for FTA and, and everywhere else, but it really is an enabler of time. So you have the benefit of time. You can focus on the higher value work. Um, you get the maximum benefit because you're actually able to process that much more and just manage the exception. So um, definitely the, the qualification process can be done using, using automation. And, and this is where we see, you know, the, the power of this kind of tool. Okay, great. Thank you. Maybe, quite, maybe just to add one more thing. Sure, Liz, the tool, please, please go ahead. Yeah, the tool, tools around automation don't, you know, it, it can help with qualification, but it can also help with prioritization of your, your workload, right? We heard on one of the earlier polls that there's not enough people and I spend too much time chasing my suppliers. Well, some of this automation and tools can also say, you know what, leave that supplier alone, stop bugging them. It's not that much savings. Like these are the suppliers and the products I need to go after so that you're optimizing your time as well um, in, the, in the entire process. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're, the 80-20 rule kind of comes into yeah. a, a effect in a case like that. Uh, this questioner is saying, we've been asked a lot about RCEP, that is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. However, our team in Asia doesn't see the benefits to use it. Why is that? Who near there on the ground in Asia? What do you think? Yeah, I think, well, it depends on which country you are in. So uh, in, in Asian countries, we already have these uh, bilateral FTAs with those uh, member countries of RCEP. So uh, in that case, we have multiple options. So RCEP is there. We have already uh, bilateral, for, for example, like Japan, Thailand, for example. So they, they already have existing FTA. So I think it's a really good question. So uh, there are multiple things that uh, you should take a look. So which FTA gives you a lower preferential rate? I think that's the one thing that you have to take a look. Because RCEP not automatically give you the best rate. So sometimes the old ones give you the best rate. So that, that could be one. And the second one is pretty much if you have already uh, FTAs that exist in, in, the, in the past, you're already using it. It is not easy to move to the RCEP. But I think, well, it, it, at the end, uh, eventually the RCEP, uh, the, the best benefit is you just need to deal with is a single rules of origin. So if you have not only for Thailand, for example, if you have another countries that you have to deal with, if you are using the old FTAs, you have to worry about those rules of origin for each FTA that you are dealing with. But with RCEP, there's one single rules of origin. And as we talked in the, in the before, 
it, it supposed to be simplify your FT, uh, FT usage. So yeah, well, I think well they have to maybe revisit you know why it's not it's not beneficial for them, but yeah, they have to think more about that kind of value chain per perspective. If you're dealing with more and more countries at the same time, maybe our set will be better, better tool, better tool out there that you can you can leverage. Yeah, maybe they're gonna find it. Oh, please go ahead, Zoe. Yeah, I think and maybe just to, maybe just to add to that too, I think. Um, the one thing to note about um, is about RCEP is that um, over time, the benefits are going to improve. So this is mm. the first year of operation, um, right. particularly in countries that already had a higher threshold for their, for their tariffs. They're scheduled to reduce those. Um, maybe this year isn't, isn't the most optimal, um, but that will, that will continue to go down. So I think it, it's actually going down over a 15, 15 year period. Um, but you'll, you'll see, you know, maybe the benefits aren't, aren't the best this year, but certainly from the, the next two to three years onwards, um, it'll continue to improve. Um, who mentioned the economies that are really excited? So Japan, first agreement with South Korea and, and China. So they're, mm. the, you know, the, the tri-powerhouse countries out here. Um, but on that journey are some of the more emerging economies. So there's a little bit more insulation going on, um, particularly within those. Not to mention what will happen if you don't participate. I mean, the benefit of just doing it proposed to those who get left behind. So I guess that's also an issue. Okay, a uh, question. Our suppliers often don't provide the certificates when we ask. How do other companies manage this problem? Okay, who's, who, who wants to, to, to talk, that, talk about that one? Maybe, uh, maybe we've touched on this a, a little bit uh, yeah, already. Okay. You you know, I think getting in the, the, the procurement process, one, um, mm -hmm. talking about education is, is probably two, and then looking at the automated or automation tools. So what is it that is currently presenting as the barrier? Is, you know, why, mm -hmm. why aren't they providing those certificates? Is it they find it too hard? They don't have the tools. So if they are using, if you are using an automation tool, which allows you to you know, effectively reach out to all of your suppliers on the basis that you're wanting to do this work, um, you know, that gives them a framework that maybe they're just importing some, some data now that that's very easy for them to understand and the ability to respond is then, you know, the rate of response is then higher. Um, that, that's probably one of the things. Um, language is also interesting. So, you know, um, every now and again, it's just asking, asking something the right way in, in the right language. Um, so don't, don't, you know, if you are working in a, in a multi, um, multi-country um, free trade agreement where language is a factor, um, sometimes having a little bit of extra uh, consideration around asking for things in, in, in the, the origin language can help. Okay, thank you so much for that. I think, that. Zoe, you touched on it earlier. It's also around contract negotiations. If your supplier is not giving you the, the support you need and the savings that your business qualifies for, um, I am certain there will be suppliers who would be willing to comply. <laughs> yeah, correct. There's always somebody else, yeah. Okay, so um, we have time, I think, for just one final question, and I'm going to pose it to the entire panel. The question is as following, what is one final top practical tip from each of you if your organization is considering embarking on a new FTA? Hoon, why don't you start on that? Yeah, well, I, I, I'd like to go with this, uh, uh, the concept that Liz introduced. So uh, I think the companies should start maybe running the preliminary analysis about their representative products to see, you know, it kind of kicking the tire approach, uh, try to calculate this origin for the target FTA so that whether you know, you, you know who to contact to gathering those data, you are testing the supplier structures, the knowledge of the suppliers as well. And, and you know, so I think Rather than do the big bank type of approach, I think once the company is running kind of a little pilot program to applying this for smaller scale, get more comfortable within the company, outside the company, also the, the regulation itself, I think it is a probably good fun stone for uh, the robust global application of this FTA. Thank you. Liz, what about you? One top practical tip. Yeah, I'm, I'll stick with the start small. It's not an all or nothing game, like Hoon said. Um, 
map those supply chains, pick, pick a product, pick a, a trade lane that, that makes sense for you and, and start there. Um, maybe pick a supplier that you're really friendly with too, so that they can help you along with this journey. So, um, cause getting that data is, is, can be part of the challenging uh, part oh, of it. So <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot to mention one thing. So another yeah. benefit of this approach is that you also can test your uh, importing countries, the customs authority as well, because mm -hmm. when you generate the certificate and the, the counterpart is not receiving it, it is a problem. So making a smaller approach to make sure that your, your document is also compliant with uh, authority out there. I think it's also a good way to kick in the tire, make sure that you are, you are getting into the right direction. Yeah, good point. <laughs> so uh, Zoe, I'm going to leave you with the last word. Well, for me, it's always about following the money. Um, you know, I think we, we talked about not everything being made equal, but, but certainly um, in the absence of free trade agreements or, or other programs, you can actually see where you're spending that extra money on duty today. So if you have high concentrations in, in certain key areas, make them your focus. So make, make reducing, reducing those duty um, impacts on the business the, the core focus. The rest of it can come along. But um, at the end of the day, what you want to be able to do is get that strong return on investment. And if you are successful, being able to expand that out, um, you know, then becomes a much easier selling point to C-suite for resource or, or whatever else it might be. So um, get, get some good runs on the board. Wow. You know, it wasn't that long ago that all the headlines were telling us that globalization is dead, that multilateral trade agreements are dead. If they're going to be any agreements at all, they're just going to be bilateral. So forget about all that. And we are learning today that that is not the case. I loved it when Zoe referred to the as bigger and bolder, the FTAs that are out there. And we've learned so much in the last hour about how companies can take advantage of these very crucial instruments. So Experts from three continents joined you today to tell you about this crucial issue. Zoe Martinez, Elizabeth Connell, Hoon Sung, all of Thomson Reuters. I want to thank you so much for that great presentation. I want to thank our audience for listening in and for posing your excellent questions. You're looking at uh, some URLs there on your screen that will access more information and additional resources. Don't worry about having to copy it down in the next 10 seconds. That information will be sent to you by email, but it is valuable as additional resources for this, uh, for this ever, ever important issue. Once again, I want to thank our great panel today, our audience as well. Everybody, have a great day. Stay well.